from your perspective, is there such thing as a call book on any property, especially free range properties? I don't believe there is. If that deer's gonna put a smile on your face, shoot it. Don't apologize for it, don't make an excuse for it, don't do whatever it is, shoot it. If that deer is the one that's gonna make you happy, then shoot it. In the world of whitetail management, few topics stir debate quite like the idea of the coal buck. For decades, hunters and land managers believe that removing inferior bucks would improve the genetic quality of a herd. But science tells a different story. So this topic of cull bucks or management bucks is really popular among gear hunters these days. Let's define it first. People like to think that there's a certain level of deer that is inferior somehow and it should be taken off the landscape to improve genetics. When we look at this, most times, you know, this conversation has transcended that somehow inferior deer exist and should be taken off to manage for bigger bucks. What it comes down to is an excuse usually. People want an excuse to shoot a deer and there's nothing wrong with that. But when we're looking at it from a scientific standpoint, the word cull and the word management really don't come into play when you're talking about free range whitetails. And there's no better source to learn about the scientific opinion on coal box than heading to Auburn, Alabama and having a chat with Dr. Stephen Ditchkoff of the Auburn University Deer Lab. So that's exactly what Dan did. All right, Steve, so we've talked about this a lot over the years. Um, from your perspective, is there such thing as a cull book on any property, especially free range properties? I don't believe there is. Um, I believe the cull book came, as you said, out of television. Um, I think it's no different than we used to call a flight attendant a stewardess. I think we've just made it, a cull book is now a management book, uh, makes it more acceptable. Uh, and it comes from the philosophy that we need to go out there and remove that individual to make room for others. That's never going to be a trophy, so that animal is of zero to little value. Let's get it off the property and make room for others. Outside of high fences, I don't believe cull bucks exist. There is a value to every individual that's out there, I believe. You'll see an antler, you'll see a buck that has four or five points on one side and just a spike on the other that someone will call it, a, well, that's a cull buck, that's a managed buck, we need to remove that one. That buck may not have trophy value in terms of book trophy value, but that buck has value to your herd in terms of a mature individual that is improving social stability, is reducing the amount of length of your breeding season, is getting your does bred quicker, is suppressing breeding of your younger males so that they can go on and they put less effort into the breeding season, come out of the breeding season better, have larger antlers the next year. Um, and that animal, is its genetics is not five on one side and a spike on the other. This is the genetics on the good antler. This is just a pedicle damage on the other. I believe we've taken the, what we've seen on TV and tried to apply it to free range herds. We tend to think of a deer herd just as a list of the bucks and the does that are out there. And we lose sight of that every time you, you remove an individual from that population, you've changed the dynamics in some way that's out there. This is a naturally functioning population. If we lower the age structure, they operate differently. If we raise the age structure, change the sex ratio, things, hap things are going to occur differently. Depending upon the direction we drive it, could be better, could be worse. Um, and I think it's a natural tendency for hunters. The, the, the first step is we just go out there, we're young, we go shoot a deer. You know, you remember your first deer, we all remember our first deer. We evolve as we learn more about management and we come, become managers and we want to better manage our deer herd. And so we start to take the tools and, and, and tricks that we learn out of, out of magazines, from television, out of books, the, from the internet, and we try and apply those. And one of those things is the management buck, is the cull buck. Well, they're doing that, so I need to do that. I don't think that that is an important tool or something that people should be trying on their own property. I don't think it is having the success that seems to be suggested on television. I think they should be far more concerned with the condition of their herd, number one. Number two, 
the condition of the habitat and the nutrients available during the period of lactation. I believe it is the most overlooked aspect of whitetail deer management, and I believe this is true across the country. And it is critical for those fawns to get a jump start on life. Whether you're doing that with habitat management, you're doing that with herd management, you're doing it with supplements, either food plots or whatever it is, if you can maximize that, then you will reap rewards three, four, and five years down, down the road. Invariably what happens is as a, as a land manager, you want to do all those right things and you go do it. And then for whatever reason, you might have some late-born fawns that are sublegal spikes. And it's like, oh, I, I messed up. I must, have not, I must have not provided enough. Well, no, I mean, there's, there's a million different reasons for that to happen. You're saying, don't worry about that. We can, we, 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 we can control does. We can't control genetics. We, we, we can't, you know, removing call bucks is not improving our herd. Um, but as a hunter, but we, we, we can allow our, our bucks to age and we can control our deer density and our doe population. Those are the two things we can really do. Anything else that we're talking about doing is Star Trek type stuff. It's really not possible. As a hunter, as hunters, we have incredible ability to influence the herd. As managers, we have incredible ability to influence the herd. Two different, two different ways. Um, as a deer hunter, obviously don't shoot those young bucks. If you're interested in larger antler deer, don't shoot the young bucks. But what you said earlier, which I think we've lost sight of, is if that deer's gonna put a smile on your face, shoot it. Don't apologize for it, don't make an excuse for it, don't do whatever it is, shoot it. If that deer is the one that's gonna make you happy, then shoot it. So as you can see, there's really no such thing as a call buck from a scientific standpoint. We need to shift this conversation and have it be about what it's really about, and that's hunting bucks, especially when you're not the landowner, hunting bucks that maybe the landowner doesn't want to hunt because we know that buck is probably not going to be that Boone and Crockett class monster that they desire. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's face it, deer hunting today is a case of the haves and have nots. If you own the land, you control the rules. You can make those guidelines. More power to you. If you don't, you have to play by the rules of that landowner. So that's where the conversation should really be. What type of buck am I going to be allowed to hunt if I don't own that property? And if I am the property owner, what are the realistic expectations for me on growing deer? And that's where we should model our harvest strategies. Deer and Deer Hunting TV is brought to you by As a hunter, as hunters, we have incredible ability to influence the herd. As managers, we have incredible ability to influence her. Two different, two different ways. Um, as a deer hunter, obviously don't shoot those young bucks. If you're interested in larger antler deer, don't shoot the young bucks. But what you said earlier, which I think we've lost sight of, is if that deer's gonna put a smile on your face, shoot it. Don't apologize for it, don't make an excuse for it, don't do whatever it is, shoot it. If that deer is the one that's gonna make you happy, then shoot it. So Steve and I are talking about the science behind so-called cull bucks. We know that there's no such thing as a cull buck, that nature is way too complicated to try to put it into little baskets like that, that you can kill these deer and not these deer. However, in management on private land, there's a thing they call a management buck. Now that is a basically a glorified way of saying a cull buck, but these are deer that you know that are on your property that you want to take out of the herd to get them off of your feed bill, so to speak. Now, I've hunted across the country and I've been on some really neat hunts, when we call them management hunts. One of the very coolest ones I experienced was in Louisiana. I got invited on a writer's hunt down there with the famous Buspis family. You know Bill, you've seen him on TV. They are just great people. And Louisiana. I've never hunted there. I've hunted up until that point 25 states for whitetails. This was going to be number 26 to check off the list. Well, Merry 
Christmas. Let's go deer hunting in Louisiana. So this buck steps out, he is kind of on a mission. He's standing on the edge of this food plot. He's working a couple licking branches, working his way down. I did not think it was going to happen, but there was a couple younger bucks in the field and one in particular that this bigger deer came up to basically show his order in the pecking order. He ran off that little buck, he flicks his tail, and here he comes right towards our blind. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for this wonderful gift. May this buck's body nourish our bodies and may his memory nourish our souls. Through Jesus' name we pray, amen. Wow, that is one heck of a buck. Fully mature, we made a good shot. He is awesome. As is the case with every deer I shoot, I am so thankful for this bounty, this venison harvest, the memories that are gonna come with it. But even more so, when I get my eyes on this Louisiana buck, this is an old Southern buck, and he just looks different. The colors in his coat, the bases on his antlers, you could tell this was a warrior. He had a snapped off brow tine. Most people would think, oh, that's a bummer, not for me. I knew this was a warrior and it's gonna be a really special one on the wall. This is the 10 point TX440 that I'm shooting. It's not only the smallest and most compact crossbow I've ever shot, it's the most technologically advanced. This thing is only 11 inches wide when uncocked and only six and a half inches wide when cocked. It is so small, but so solid, and you can see so accurate. What they have built into this crossbow for me is that peace of mind when I shoot, it's right on, but everything is so put together on this thing. They have the, it's basically the barrel is arrow rest. So the, the knock actually knocks, it clicks in there, unlike other crossbows, and that arrow is traveling not across the rail. So it's a railless design. It's very, very nice. There's so many things about this crossbow that I could tell you about, but for me, the biggest thing is shooting out of a blind like this. A lot of times you just, if even if you have to freehand it, if you can't shoot it off of a, a tr tripod like this, you can just get up there nice and small and tight and shoot and not have to worry about, you know, the clearance that you have to worry about on a bigger crossbow. A lot of times those limbs come forward, you have to worry about your windows, you have to worry about uh, the rails on your ladder stands, things like that. This takes that out of the equation by a lot. And also if I'm hunting out of a tree stand, I can just kind of tuck myself up into the tree stand and shoot without having to worry. And it's not that heavy. Too many things to talk about in this crossbow in just this short amount of time, but a couple other things you want to look at here. That pistol grip, you can do competition style shooting with this thing. 
and also the ambidextrous safety. That's like an AR safety on here. I can click that off on the right side or the left side. And let's face it, a lot of times in the heat of the moment, you fumble for that safety. This, you can get it super easy, get your shot off fast, especially if that deer's on you in a hurry. So the things I like the most about it, the compact design, how accurate it is, and 440, that, yep, that's right, 440 feet per second. That's supreme confidence out of a very little crossbow. 10-point TX 440, check them out at your local dealer, or for more information, 10pointcrossbows.com. Hey guys, you want to lay a scent trail, but you don't have a scent drag, you don't have to worry about that anymore. You can use scent spray. This stuff works. This is Golden Doe. It's premium estrus scent with scent reflex technology. My stand's back here. I just want to lay a scent trail up here in case these deer are coming through here. They smell it and it's going to funnel them all the way down. I don't want to go too far. This is super easy. You don't have to overthink this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this up and then not touching the wick, I'm going to bring the wick up and on my branch, right there. Just shake this up really good. It's blowing right down there. It does not take much. A deer only needs one molecule on that epithelium to smell it, and that buck's gonna think there's an estrus doe coming through. It brings them right down to where our stand is, which is about 75, 80 yards down into the woods. So if you're frustrated on how deer are coming through your hunting area, they're not getting close enough to your stand, whether you're bow hunting or you're gun hunting, get yourself some scent, create a scent funnel, and bring the deer to you. For more information, check this out at wildlife.com. Right there.